All right, whenever you're ready. Okay. Uh, testing real quick. Cool. Um, hi. Uh, good morning from the West Coast. Um, I'm Jack Conrad. I'm a, a PhD candidate at uh, UC Santa Cruz. I work primarily with Francis Nemo. Uh, I study a whole bunch of different things, uh, given that I work with Francis. Um, but mostly I've been uh, focused on tectonics of uh, I see worlds and the interior evolution of the moon and icy worlds as well. Um, so I thought I would start off by talking about uh, two projects which I've published on already. Um, the first of which is on the left. Uh, I've been looking at the uh, tectonic features of Viking Terra on Pluto. Um, to give you a sense of where that is, that's to the west of the uh, big uh, basin of Sputnik Planitia. Um, there's a whole bunch of large normal faults in that area um, and we um, can use these faults to get a sense of the uh, uh, thickness and evolution of the subsurface ocean on Pluto. Um, because these faults are directly linked to the uh, freezing of the subsurface ocean and the expansion of the overlying ice shell, and that's going to ca that causes a whole bunch of uh, um, uh, surface strain. Um, and so, by looking at the size of these things, we can uh, get a sense of uh, the thickness of the ocean when they formed, and um, and the actual story here is that um, these faults are still kind of small. Um, and so they're only really, they only give a sense of the uh, sort of maximum heat flux um, at the time. Um, and um, if anything, they're still growing. Um, and if you want to read more on that, uh, the paper is in Icarus. Um, my other paper is also in Icarus. Uh, it's um, a study of the sort of uh, new or uh, lunar impact basin catalog, which was uh, created using grail bouquet gravity data. Um, so I uh, use mapping techniques, uh, basic crater counting to apply a, a relative age to some of these newly found impact structures where there's not a clear topography signature, but you see it very clearly in the gravity um, and sort of compare their degradation states to their sort of relative ages, and I found that there is a transition in the relaxation state. Um, and we can use this transition in the relaxation state sort of tie together um, impact bombardment models with uh, lunar magma ocean cooling models. Um, and so you can find that in Icarus. It's a bit of a long paper. Um, so if you ever want uh, help going over it, I will gladly uh, talk with you if you email me. Um, so next slide, please. Uh, so just a bit more general of a slide. Um, in terms of what I study, I like to study global scale topography, heat production, interior evolution, cryo volcanism, and how all that relates to solar system structure and vice versa. Uh, the way I do this is through mapping, spherical harmonics, tectonic models, and um, recently I've been dabbling with terrain evolution models. Um, my contact information is on the right there. Um, uh, and I'm currently looking for postdocs that start either in the fall of this year or early next year. I'm kind of rather flexible. Um, and uh, I think that's it. Thank you very much. Great, great. Thank you, Jack. All right, and next up is Angela. Here you are. Can you unmute yourself? Okay. There, there we go. Yep. Um, thank you, first off, to the LPI for hosting today's virtual event. My name is Angela Dapperma, and I am a 
PhD candidate at the Georgia Institute of Technology, as well as a graduate student researcher at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. And today I'm going to talk about the topic of my dissertation, which I'm hoping to complete in about a year, which is mud volcanism on Mars. And I've primarily been using orbital remote sensing data sets to study this process on the Martian surface. And so I wanted to start out with the image that you see on the right, um, which is a global view of Mars. It's a colorized elevation map. And uh, the black squares that you see are locations where previous workers have suggested the presence of mud volcanoes or some sort of uh, mud volcano-like process. And so while a lot of these previous works have been extremely valuable in um, communicating information about the morphometric and morphologic characteristics of suggested mud volcanism products on Mars, in working on my dissertation, I noticed that broad scale compositional analysis seemed to be an area where more information could be added. So next slide, please. Oh, next slide, please. Yeah, so you need to go one more, don't you need to go one more slide? Oh no, this is perfect, thank you. Oh, okay. Uh, so we conducted a um, global study of the compositional characteristics of suggested mud volcanism products on Mars. And so what you see here in the middle um, is a global map with the color stars representing um, the uh, several locations and then they correlate with the um, color boxes that you see on the slide as well. And so this work is currently in the revision stage in the journal Icarus. And I wanted to include these images from the manuscript because I feel that they do a good job of of um, visually representing some of the selected key points that are on the slide. So we found that suggested mud volcanism products on Mars exhibit variable degrees of hydration. And so this is alluding to differences in water content. In Val's Moneris, where the purple star is, uh, separate proposed mud volcanism products exhibit unaltered hydrated glass of a volcanic origin and then high calcium pyroxene signatures. And then finally, we were able to conclude that limitations in the mineral um, detection, specifically phyllosilicates, carbonates, and sulfates were likely due to the grain size and or textural characteristics of suggested mud volcanism products on Mars. And this is important because getting into a little bit of comparative planetology, while the presence of these minerals is not uh, required for mud volcanism to operate on Earth, they are often associated with this process on Earth. So this work has been a, a valuable contribution to the study of mud volcanism on Mars, but another area worth examining uh, is the origin of pitted cones and um, whether or not a formation scenario of igneous or mud volcanism can be applied to these features. Um, and this is an area of ongoing debate in the planetary science community. So the next slide, please. Uh, so we um, examined pitted cones in a uh, Hephaestus Fosse study region um, on the surface of Mars. And so that's where you see the um, orange outline star over top, over top the global map. And this work is also currently in the revision stage in their journal JGR Planet. So in the upper left, image A, that's the, a close-up view of our study area, the Fosse or truss features themselves, surrounded by um, uh, high resolution images showing examples of the pitted cones. In the bottom left, uh, particularly C and D, those are topographic profiles acquired via morphometric analysis. And you can see how they compare with igneous features on both Earth and Mars. And then in the upper right, those are our spatial analysis input. We mapped um, pitted cones in our study area. And then in the bottom right are the um, uh, spectro spectroscopy analysis results. So image C, that um, is a blue spectrum consistent um, with the presence of igneous, um, consistent with the presence of uh, an ig igneous origin for um, the Fosse cone. So that's key point number one. And then morphometrically, the cones um, exhibit similarities with igneous and mud volcanism products elsewhere on Mars, but the, um, the topographic profiles are more consistent with cinder cones. And then finally, the spatial analysis results revealed that the cones were clustered. So we weren't able to use it as a differentiating tool, but it was really valuable in revealing some sort of link between subsurface activity and the surface expression of the cones. So thank you so much for listening today. And I'm happy to discuss uh, these efforts or my ongoing work at NASA Goddard focused on analytical modeling of mud volcanoes with anyone who might be interested. 
Hey, thank you, Angela. Uh, and I think one thing we've I've just noticed is there's appears to be at least right now a bit of a delay uh, from the time that I uh, advance the slide until you actually see it. <laughs> so, coming um, next presentations, if uh, if you ask to see the next slide and it takes a few seconds, that's okay. <laughs> uh, it should be on its way. Okay. Right, and we have our second Angela of the afternoon. Uh, so uh, go ahead whenever you're ready. Thank you, and thank you again for organizing this great event. Um, so my name is Angela Marusiak. Uh, just last week, I defended my PhD thesis. Um, and what my thesis mostly focused on is how we can prepare for future geophysical missions, especially those with seismic instrumentation, using terrestrial analogs. So the first half of my work was dedicated really to the InSight mission, and how well we might be able to constrain the core size um, and state using core reflected phases. Um, so the top figures are from my Icarus paper, which um, has been available since last summer, and I can provide links um, or copies of it if necessary. And what I was able to show is that um, we should be able to recover the core size with the few as three to five SCS events. Um, and the quality of those events doesn't actually have a strong um, correlation to how well we're able to recover the core and uncertainty. So what the x-axis is showing is increasing quality. So you can see even low quality events or just any sort of quality event is still able to recover the core with a really high um, recovery rate. What also I did show is that um, as you increase in quantity, so you're going from blue, red, black to green, you're decreasing the uncertainty in the core depth. Um, so the more events we have, the better we should be able to discover the Martian core depth and lower that uncertainty. And while this was focused on InSight and Mars, um, it does have applications to really any sort of large terrestrial body or any large scale feature. In addition to Mars and deep structure, I was also interested in icy and ocean worlds. Um, so I did two different field campaigns, um, one in Alaska, one in Greenland, um, and one of the goals was to quantitatively compare science capabilities of traditional terrestrial equipment along with our Flight Canada instrumentation, which was uh, smaller in mass and volume, which made it more ideal. We also wanted to compare different deployment mechanisms and different deployment schemes. So how, do, how well do our instruments work when you put them on the ground versus when you couple them to a mock lander or put them on top of a mock lander deck? Um, so one of the figures I have shown here is how well I was able to detect, identify, and locate some of the local seismicity. Um, so what you can kind of see it from this rose diagram is a lot of the seismicity tends to point down glacier from where it's breaking up and fracturing and we have drainage vents. Another large um, sort of subset points towards um, a nearby cliff, um, which kind of indicates that we were seeing rock falls as well as ice cracking events. And some events were also ported to um, some of our equipment, which kind of indicates that we need to be mindful of what we're bringing with us because those can also generate seismic sources. Um, so if you can advance to the next slide. Um, I was able to do the majority of the work using a combination of MATLAB programming as well as Python programming. Um, MATLAB I learned as an undergrad, but Python I was um, self-taught. Um, as I mentioned, I did a lot of field work in remote uh, and uh, Arctic conditions. They were primarily focused on seismic studies, but I also did some GPR and IPR while I was out there. Um, in terms of data analysis, I'm used to working with really large data sets um, in terms of terabytes in size. Um, for one example, I had to go through over 10,000 seismic events. Um, in order to do this, I built myself a nice little GUI. That way I could get it done in a matter of hours rather than um, you know, days or weeks. Predominantly, I use a lot of different signal processing methods. So I filtered the data and I analyzed the data both in time series and also in the spectral domain. Um, along with this, I do some statistical analysis, so different methods of quantifying uncertainties, um, as well as uh, testing for correlations um, to see how things could or could not be related and if those were statistically significant. Um, I also did a little bit of synthetic modeling, so comparing how do our models show what we should be seeing compared to what our actual data is showing. Um, throughout my career, I've done a lot of different styles of communication. Um, I've presented at seven different conferences, as well as insight meetings um, and other sort of small events. Um, I have two first author publications, screenshots are shown here, as well as four additional co-authors and four more papers, including two first authors are in the pipeline. 
Um, I was also a member of the AGU's Voices for Science program, which allowed me to do a lot of outreach events. Um, this included talking to museums and school kids, but also talking to reporters and presenting at professional conferences and to professional societies. Um, in terms of grant writing, I've been successful in pulling in about $90,000 of external funding, the majority of which came from the NASA NSF program, which is now referred to as the NASA Finest program. Um, and if you move to the next slide, I have my contact info up there, so email is the best way to get in touch with me. I'm also pretty actor, active on Twitter um, and LinkedIn, and if you scan that QR code, it'll bring you to my webpage, which has links to my CV as well as my Google Scholar pages and um, just other information you might need to know about me. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. And uh, next is uh, Gavin. So, Ooh. <laughs> All right, so uh, whenever you're ready. All right, so uh, yeah, thank you again for putting this whole event together. So very happy that the LPIs uh, give me, us a chance to talk about our research. So uh, yeah, my name is Gavin. I'm a penultimate year PhD candidate at the University of Western Ontario and the Institute for Sp Earth and Space Exploration. Uh, expected to finish my research by late summer 2021. Uh, mainly focusing on volcanic and impact melt flows. Uh, so I first wanted to focus on two of the projects that involve looking at volcanic melt flows. Uh, the first one, because of a joint, the first one involves studying the topographic roughness of lava flows at Craters of the Moon National Monument and Preserve in Idaho, and trying to determine if there's a correlation between its roughness based seen from the field and in radar remote sensing data to its composition. And this involved a two field deployments in 2016 and 2017 of visiting the site for an average of two weeks each time, uh, where we got to use a variety of tools, mainly traditional field work, uh, LIDAR uh, systems, and geo other geophysical equipment. And currently, all those results have been, are currently going through edits and a first author publication that will be published in the near future and which actually led to a third field deployment at a second site looking at the 2014-2015 Holorun eruption in Iceland where I was actually able to be the field lead, the logistics lead for that uh, field deployment and at that site we really wanted to look at how we could un better understand the emplacement of Martian lava flows by studying these Icelandic lava flows since they hold the most analogous morphology and surface roughness here on Earth. And that did involve about two weeks in the field using very similar equipment we used to craze the moon with access to more uh, other remote sensing uh, data from the unmanned aerial vehicle synthetic aperture radar. Uh, if we can go to the next slide. So in terms of the skill sets used for this research, uh, remote sensing wise, I focused on three particular types. Uh, optical, uh, ranging from centimeter to meter scales, just so we could get a good idea of the morphology of these terrestrial lava flows and how we could better understand planetary lo uh, lava flows. And we used radar since it's able to analyze the surface roughness of these different flow types. Uh, but ma I mainly focused at the decimeter scale since that's one of the most widely available uh, wavelengths in planetary radar, and it's probably the most comparable we have with terrestrial radar. And an expansion on that, when we went to Holorun, we wanted to see if there was a relationship between decimeter scale and centimeter scale roughness, since centimeter scale roughness isn't very available for planetary radar data sets. So we wanted to use LIDAR data sets on Earth, mainly looking at the Icelandic lava flows, to see if we could compare roughness statistics, such as RMS slope and the Hearst exponent, to quantified radar data, such as circular polarization ratios, which can tell us whether or not we can see any relationships, and if we can learn more about how these lava flows were emplaced. A lot of this data, that I use, the skill sets I used to process and analyze this data mainly came using the USGS uh, integrated software for images and spectrometers. That's where I've done a majority of my work, along with using ArcGIS quite extensively. 
Uh, some of the processing and data analysis, I used basic skills in Python coding and IDL to be able to convert the data into readable formats and then be able to read the data. And thank you. And I was also able to learn a little bit of MATLAB to learn some new programs, which we can actually see in the next slide, which I had to learn when studying for the third, third and final part for my PhD research was, was trying to understand more about melt, impact melt flows, in particular looking at its temperature. And this involved a lot of crystallographic and geochemical work, which is a little bit different from the remote sensing research aspect. But what I did was using studying these zircon grains and their high temperature phases using electron backscatter diffraction analysis, we were able to try and figure out how hot impact melt could have been on Earth and try to compare it to lunar impact melts, since they're the most well preserved that we can find in our solar system. And this involved a lot of uh, a little bit of MATLAB uh, scripts to be able to process this data and some more work using our. Uh, ArcGIS to look for lunar impact melts that are most comparable to Earth. Uh, you can, if you would like to learn more about switches, I'm happy to talk more about the planetary volcanism and impact rating side of this. Uh, all my contact information is on the right. I also have a website that's also gavinonthemoon.wix, and you'll be able to find me there and happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Gavin. Yeah. And. Um... Hey, up next is, we've got Joe Schools. Uh, all right, so Joe Drago. All right, whenever you're ready, Joe. All right, uh, before I start, I just wanna say thank you to the organizers for putting this together in these trying times. It's really appreciated. Right, so this first slide is just a little summary of my PhD research in figures. So what I look at is uh, melt migration processes in the lithosphere of both Mars and Io. This is an interesting depth to look at because it's sort of above where melt generates in the mantle, but below where we think of traditional magma plumbing structures in the crust. And it's an area that really even on Earth hasn't been looked at all that well. So in this figure on the uh, upper left, uh, what you see in the red box is that's the region where melt generates and travels up through the thermal lithosphere along inner grain boundaries uh, in the rock matrix. And as it cools down, as the thermal profile goes down, uh, as melt ascends, things crystallize out. And really, my research is looking at the ramifications of this melt migration and crystallization. And so we do that in two ways. The first way, if you move over to the upper right, uh, is we do it in petrological, or we uh, look at petrological models. So we show how as melt cools, what minerals crystallize out, and how much of it crystallizes out. And then we take that and run it through a simple one-dimensional geodynamic model where we uh, see where uh, the melt crystallizes out too much and actually clogs these melt pathways. And so we call that a permeability barrier. And that's where melt is trapped and subsequent melt can't rise past it. And that's, in Mars anyway, that is below where we think brittle processes could take over. So that is a ductile regime and melt is just seemingly trapped there. So then we move into the uh, 2D numerical models to see the ramifications of that, which you can see in the lower left. So this black part is basically the permeability barrier. So as melt accumulates and accumulates, things start to crystallize. What we actually see happen is kind of surprising. You get this uh, density-driven solid liquid convection. And so things crystallize and densify, come down, uh, heat up, uh, melt, and you know, become less dense and rise up. And the interesting thing is if you actually, uh, these models are calibrated to what we expect uh, the emplacement conditions of volcanoes during uh, on Syria plan them to be. And the spacing of these downwellings actually matches up with the spacing of volcanic features at the surface. So there, it seems like a crazy idea, but there might actually be something to it. Uh, we also look at Io. So Io, we do petrologic models too. And we also do 2D numeric models. Since on Io, we know that there are these discrete eruptive centers called heat pipes. We uh, don't model necessarily how things travel through the lithosphere, but we are interested in how melt flows and accumulates in the mantle and uh, how you actually can focus an entire planet's worth of melt essentially to these discrete centers. And sort of the surprising thing that we learned there is if you invoke thermal convection, not the density driven convection uh, from Mars, but just the traditional thermal convection that we think is happening in the Ionian mantle, uh, your, if you have your heat pipe above your upwelling, that's actually not a great way to focus melt. That actually pushes melt away 
and sort of just builds and builds and builds and melts in the mantle until there's just too much melt or an unrealistic amount of melt. The more efficient way is actually if you have uh, the uplowings anti-correlated with the location of these eruptive centers, and it actually focuses melt nicely towards the uh, eruptive center. And so the solid flows down, but the liquid preferentially flows up. All right, next slide. So in order to make these models, I do a fair amount of numerical modeling, petrological modeling. Uh, specifically, I do petrological modeling is all in uh, using the MELT software out of Caltech and uh, Mark Yorso. And the numerical modeling, I primarily use uh, both my own MATLAB codes and Aspect, which is a big community code written mostly in C++. Uh, relevant experience to this, so the IO work is actually funded by a NASA Earth and Space Science Fellowship, now known as Finest. Uh, I also have done some work with planetary volcanology through the NASA Planetary Vol Volcanology Workshop. I'm not exclusively a planetary scientist either. I also do some earth work and uh, that did some subductions or sediment survival and subduction zones through uh, si the CIDR workshop. Uh, sort of my general research interests, I'm really interested in mantle processes, uh, specifically melt, going all the way from mantle melting to surface eruptions, so just the whole system all the way through, including cryovolcanism. And right now I'm really interested in brittle deformation and cracking, sort of, uh, I've done a lot of work in the hot ductile regime, but how does melt interact with these cold, brittly deforming parts? And also just constraining the structure and evolution of planetary interiors, comparing, or, and I do that by comparing model output to our surface image, the, our surface imagery that we have. Next slide. And this is me, so my defense is July 24th of this year, so I am ready to go imminently. Uh, that's my email, and that is my website, joeschools.space, and there you can find all this good stuff like LinkedIn and Google Scholar, et cetera. And with that, thank you. Great. Right. Thank you, Joe. Okay, next up is Hannes. Let's go ahead and, yep, there you are. Very good. Uh, okay, whenever you're ready. Hi, uh, I'm Anders Bernhardt from Maryland State University. Uh, thanks for setting this up, um, by the way. So I just finished uh, my postdoc. I am mostly involved with uh, uh, geomorphologic research on Mars and integrating that with um, field studies on Earth. Um, uh, in that respect, I've met, worked on all kinds of different processes, uh, mostly uh, glacial and volcanic processes and their potential interactions which is of course very important for the um, ancient environment on Mars. Um, part of that is of course, um, finding out how habitable the planet uh, might have been in its past and for how long, uh, story of liquid water and so forth, where um, volcanism, but also tectonics and impacts play a huge role. Um, I focused, uh, since my PhD and now for my postdoc, I'm focused on two areas on Mars. Um, that is the Mars-related research that I did, focused on two areas on Mars, Hellas Planitia and South of it, Maria Planum, both of which you see here, as well as the uh, conjoined, stitched together, um, high detailed uh, photogeologic maps I did. Those are the starting points of my investigations <clears throat> to get a comprehensive overview over the area, which involves, of course, uh, crater counting and stratigraphic analyses, and as well as hyperspectral analyses for mineralogy and all these things that uh, you can hit an area with with all the uh, remote sensing data sets we have at our disposal nowadays. Um, so in Hellas, for example, I also um, dedicated uh, two publications uh, on very specific areas uh, which feature very weird terrain. Um, suffice to say, um, I got comprehensive overview of both areas and then sort of followed the sedimentary stream and also the, the stream of volcanic material upwards onto Malia Planum, which is a huge volcanic area. And here, just as a, um, a snapshot to highlight uh, the sort of work I'm doing, which is, as I said, focus on a lot of different processes. Um, I want to um, highlight Pitiosa Patera, that's a large depression on Malia Planum, which uh, might be the largest and oldest caldera on Mars. Next slide, please. So here you see a um, zoomed in version of the uh, photogeologic map of Pitiosa Patera. It has some uh, really weird material in red. 
um, which um, doesn't occur in any other patera on Mars and um, doesn't occur anywhere outside of it, uh, outside this patera as well. It consists of folded material um, that using um, digital terrain models as well as um, um, art map add-ons, um, I was able to measure the average dip angles as well as um, derive the strain uh, at a, a roughly 2%. Um, now, where does the strain come from? Um, absent plate tectonics, your, um, uh, your candidates are limited. But sitting in the center of a patera, which might be a huge caldera, as in a volcanic collapse feature, um, the, uh, the strain, the compressive strain in this case, might be related to uh, actual caldera formation, and then therefore be a hint of this thing actually being a huge caldera. Um, so it doesn't make sense. Um, this was just a, um, a uh, study of feasibility, uh, whether it could happen that way. And it turns out that the shortening um, that uh, would be created by the center of the caldera sagging down as a funnel type caldera, where you compress the center part um, in a sort of a, a telescope shaped form, which then uh, sags in, uh, would create exactly the amount of compression that would be needed to create the folding, the strain that, um, that I measured. So um, I back computed, proving the, uh, proving the idea, and the two strains are um, comparable. So shortening by catalytic collapse is possible. This is just one snapshot highlighting the type of work, going from the large picture of the maps to a specific problem like this, and then integrating a lot of those individual pieces to a comprehensive uh, landscape formation story and finding out more about it habitability of volcanic history on Mars. Last slide, please, with the contact information. So um, he can grab a hold of me with the QR codes to research gay Google Scholar and Scopus. Uh, as I said, I just finished my postdoc and this is about to be published. Um, and yeah, I hope you reach out to me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hannes. Um, and next up is Marissa. Hello, can you hear me okay? Yes, yes we can, so uh, whenever you're ready. Fantastic, um, so hello, uh, good evening from the UK, I hope you're all doing well. Uh, my name is Marissa and I'm a second year PhD student at the University of Manchester. Uh, so like many, I came to planetary science from a geology background before specialising in volcanology for my masters and then starting a PhD in lunar volcanism uh, about a year and a half ago. So my PhD project aims to quantify the amount of volatiles within lunar magmas using numerical modelling and analysis of images of the lunar surface. So I guess the first question is why do we care about lunar, uh, lunar volatiles? Um, so first of all from a volcanology perspective uh, they're important for driving volcanic eruptions. Um, secondly as incompatible elements volatiles can be great traces for processes that occurred during the moon's evolution, such as crystallization of the lunar magma ocean or mantle overturn. Um, and then finally, they can also tell us about the moon's formation right at the beginning, since quantifying the amount of volatiles within the, within the lunar mantle tells us how elements partitioned between the Earth and the moon following a giant impact. Um, so as you probably know, volatiles have been measured in lunar samples for decades, but there are still uncertainties with these measurements in terms of contamination and possible post-crystallization diffusion of volatile elements. So rather than using lab-based measurements, I'm trying to quantify this using volcanology, modeling, geomorphology, and image analysis. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so I can split my project into three main sections. The main section I'm working on right now is modeling magma ascent. So I'm adapting a model for terrestrial magma ascent, um, which is based in Fortran 90, MATLAB and Python. Um, and as you probably know, magma ascent is a very complex process, as I'll try to show in a bit of detail in the figure there. Um, so to model this, I've been drawing on lots of existing data sets for the chemistry of lunar pyroclastic glass beads, measurements of the moon's crystal thickness, and lots of other parameters. So the aim is that this model will tell me what eruption conditions were like at an erupt event on the moon, such as eruption rate um, and the amount of gas exolution. Uh, the second part of the project, uh, which follows on from this, is modelling pyroclastic eruptions themselves. 
Um, so again, this will probably take the form of adapting some sort of terrestrial model and seeing how it chalks up on the moon. Um, and I'm hoping to model the dispersal of pyroclasts within two dimensions. Um, and I'm looking at pyroclastic material of all compositions from the low titanium to the high titanium compositions. Um, and then the final part of my project is going to be analysing images of the lunar surface to ground truth the results from my models. So I'll be using the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter images for this, as well as USGS software such as ISIS and AIM Stereo Pipeline to look at the dimensions of real dark mantling deposits. Um, so as you can see, um, a lot of my project is looking at how terrestrial models can be applied on uh, on the moon and seeing how we can ground truth those um, without necessarily using lab uh, based measurements to do this. Uh, next slide please. Uh, so, aside from my PhD research on lunar volcanism, I've also looked at Martian volcanism during my master's project. Um, I worked with Lionel Wilson at Lancaster University on some Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter laser altimeter data for different lava flows in the Jovis Tholus area of Mars, um, which you can see in the white boxes of that image there. Uh, so again, this was looking at how the morphology of volcanic deposits reflected the eruption conditions and what that could tell us about the volcanic history of the area. And also from a comparative planetology perspective, um, it was also seeing how terrestrial analog experiments um, and different equations derived from those could be applied to Mars. Um, I've also dipped my toe into analog experiments related to volcanology. So a strange phenomenon which hasn't been explored a lot is bubble chains, which are these structures which form in viscoelastic fluids, which um, are generally, thank you, uh, similar, similar rheologically to magma. So in the picture, you can see a plastic tube with cellicize, which is a type of cellulose solution. And in it, you can see a chain of connected bubbles running up it. Um, so these bubbles are really stable in the fluid and only form under certain conditions. Um, and they've been documented quite well in the world of fluid mechanics, but there's only been a couple of abstracts and papers thinking about how they could relate to, relate to volcanic systems. So I've been working with the Volcanology Research Group at Durham University on some analog experiments and um, see how this would scale or if it would, if it would scale to um, real basaltic um, volcanic systems. Um, so yeah, thanks everyone for listening. Um, I won't be finishing my PhD until spring 2022, um, but if anyone wants to chat about collaborations or internships or any other opportunities, uh, you can come say hello on Twitter or feel free to drop me an email. Thank you. Thank you, Marissa. And uh, so that wraps up uh, this afternoon's session.